So today we're going to talk about follow the money, records of the accounting officers of the Department of Treasury. This actually is one of my favorite record groups to deal with in the National Archives. These records are found in the National Archives. There is a website, archives.gov, that you can access that will get you to some of the Treasury records, but it will get you to information about the various series of records we're going to talk about today, but it may or may not get you to the actual records. If you were to go to archives.gov and go to the federal records catalog, you would find, if you were to plug in 217, you would find the records of the accounting officers of the Department of the Treasury, and then you would find an overview of records locations. And they're spread out a little bit, but a majority of them are located in downtown DC. And then you'll get this table of contents that will talk about the administrative history and various records that exist in various sections of the record group. So when we look at what's available, you can see that there's 34,000 square feet at NWCT1, and that's the National Archives downtown. Before 2008, they were pretty much split because of spacing issues in the downtown archives. And there was a lot of stuff out in College Park. And there were circumstances where a register would be in downtown, but the records would be in College Park or vice versa. It was a good time. Uh, but things changed in 2008 when they consolidated everything back downtown. Because uh, the only people who were actually touching these records were genealogists. So originally, the government created a finding aid on these records. It was known as Inventory 14, and it's the only finding aid that I've ever found that the government created on microfiche. So fortunately, I had a microfiche reader, so this was not a problem for me, but it got to be fairly frustrating over time to always pull out the microfiche and then hunt on the microfiche to find something. So I sat down and retyped the finding aid, made some corrections because there were some errors in the finding aid, and added a thousand entries that Mr. Sherman, when he created this finding aid, failed to include. These are the undescribed items. And I'll talk a little bit about those at the end today. So in 1997, I created sort of a revised annotated inventory number 14. Now inventory means that the archivists are fairly sure that they found everything. However, they used the word inventory and the word undescribed at the same time. So it was just kind of unfortunate. And I was able to fix it. Have fallen asleep many nights reading this finding aid. In 1789, there were three accounting officers. One was a registrar, one was a controller, and one was an auditor. Basically, one recorded the stuff, one approved the stuff, and one made sure it went where it was supposed to go. The register kept central fiscal records, and basically these are the ledgers and journals that exist today, filed all the settled accounts where they belonged uh, and their claims, and prepared the annual reports for the Congress. From a genealogical perspective today, we don't have too much to do with him. The auditor is the individual who settled all the accounts and claims subject to the approval of the comptroller. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our time. Now, eventually there will be six auditors, but in the very beginning, there was just one. The comptroller is the individual who makes sure that everything is copacetic. He certifies the balances for the Congress and sends them all back uh, to the registrar to let him know that everything is okay. There are a few things that we're gonna look at in regards to the comptroller. So in the office of the register of the treasury, the one thing that we're going to find is checks. Now, a warrant, which is what this series of records is called, are these are the government checks. So a government check is a warrant. It's a call on the appropriation, on the appropriate appropriation. And these are arranged by year in boxes, and they're under by department, and they're under by type, and they're under by warrant number. It's possible for you to be able to find a copy of a check or not a copy of a check, but rather the check that your Union Civil War soldier was paid his final account with uh, 
if he was a pensioner from it, from the Civil War. So I've actually gone looking for a couple of mine, um, and I haven't found them. But it's a tedious task. But one day I will find them. I know exactly what pension office they should be in. I just probably end up with the wrong boxes. You can see interior pensions. This is when the Interior Department was in charge of pensions. This is 1908. The pensioner is Henry Wirt. And what we have down at the bottom is his address in Champaign, Illinois. I love touching these. That's about all we're going to see from that side of the house. Then we go to the first comptroller. And the first comptroller took care of military accounts until after the War of 1812 when the second comptroller was created. And basically the second comptroller was created because the first comptroller couldn't handle it anymore following the military accounts necessary to take care of because of the War of 1812. If you were to go to the Federal Records Guide, you would see there are these various divisions uh, within the office of the first comptroller. Although I may not talk about it today, there may be things that would be of interest to you, say, if you lived in the District of Columbia at some point in time or had ancestry there, or you had someone who was interested in public lands or territorial accounts, internal revenue accounts. Those are the Civil War accounts in the 1860s, that kind of thing. But one of the things that's there is destitute seamen. A destitute seaman is an American sailor who, as under contract, ended up, let's say, in Europe, but his contract is either voided or it comes to an end or whatever, and he's trapped in Europe and he has no way to come home. State Department would, through their counselor, consulates, provide money to seamen so that they could return home. So the register of these is located in the first comptroller. And that's probably, that's the only thing I've ever found of interest for me, but you know, I, your interest may be different than mine. The office of the second comptroller, it began in 1817 following the War of 1812, and it was responsible for military accounts and claims. It was abolished in 1894, just before the Spanish-American War by a few years. And it also contains the appropriate registers and journals. Again, going to the Federal Records Guide, we can see uh, lots of things that I, as a military guy, am interested in, the Army Paymaster Division, the Army Pension Division, Quartermaster, the Navy, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is covered here, and some miscellaneous claims. There are claims for pay due to de deceased soldiers from 1854 to 1861. So these are soldiers who basically were killed during the Indian Wars during that period of time prior to the Civil War. And it also contains information from the military asylum that's St. Elizabeth's today uh, prior to uh, the Civil War. So if a soldier died, his pay, his effect, the value of his effects, and those kind of things would end up with an heir. And this is a register of that happening. Along with that register are the claims that were settled. So these would show the soldier's name, a, a certificate number, the claimant's relationship to the soldier, uh, the agent or attorney's name. This is a circumstance where you may have a soldier in a fort in the West. He dies and he owes someone money, a sutler, for example. And this is an, the agent of the sutler or an attorney coming in and getting uh, that claim taken care of from the residual of the soldier's pay. Uh, there are other circumstances where that might occur, but generally it's someone saying they have a claim against the estate of the soldier. And these are, notice that these are in the middle of the Civil War. These are the, the numbers that you see uh, in the upper left are the entry numbers in that finding aid. So if you were to go to entry number 201 in the finding aid that I showed you, you would see that it described, basically you would see that it said these words. And basically entry 
201 is a register of proceeds from the sale of effects of deceased soldiers. Whereas today, when a soldier dies, his effects are sent to his next of kin. In this time period, what would happen is the effects of the soldier would be sold, generally to other soldiers in his unit. The money would be collected. The paymaster would collect that money and then that money would be sent to the next of kin. So this register is a register of that money, which was obtained by the paymaster due to the sale of the effects of deceased soldiers. Now also in the controller, in the second controller is the third auditor pension reports. So these deal with individuals and the money that they might receive from pensions. And basically this is the controller overviewing the auditors look at those. Now, what we have today that's also from record group 217 and on Ancestry, I'll talk about in a bit. And those are the actual pension ledgers for Revolutionary War soldiers and War of 1812 invalid soldiers from 1818 to, well, there's the invalids and then the 1818 to 1872. There are also quartermaster contracts. And this is the way that most civilians interact with the military. Uh, they're selling them something. And these are arranged by year and they're generally under the contractor's surname. So you'd have to know the contractor, which is could be fun. What you will also find among these contracts is usually the quartermaster would advertise in a local newspaper that they needed something. So here is, here is a request for 230 cords of wood that should be delivered to Fort Trumbull and Fort Griswold in the harbor of New London sometime whatever year this is, they'll be receiving bids until the 1st of June. You will find this in newspapers, and then you could track it down and find where an actual contract was issued. Now, the other place you wanna look, because these are just the contracts, in Quartermaster Files itself in Record Group 92 in the correspondence of the Quartermaster General, you will find all kinds of neat things like samples of wool that someone is saying that this is what I want to make Navy uh, Army blankets out of or something like that. So it's pretty cool. So the office of the first auditor is when we um, start to get a little more fun. There's no military connection after 1792, but what is in here are the internal revenue accounts for after 1863. And those internal revenue accounts are on microfilm and on Ancestry and they come in two flavors. And eventually the Supreme Court will rule that the Internal Revenue Act of 1863 is unconstitutional, and that will eventually result in an amendment to the constitution that says income tax is okay. Again, I've showed you this before, but what's most important here is the information from the customs division probably for the non-military folk. There is in a War of 1812 account, entry 315, that deals with the expenditures for prisoners of war uh, from 1812 to 1816. A good place to find out whether your 1812 soldier was a prisoner of war outside of the compiled military service record might be in one of Baker's or Johnson's books on prisoners. And there are multiple prison camps that they've done books for. But this accounts for uh, the expenditure, salaries of guards, parole officers, pilots of ships, purchase of provisions, and those kind of things. So this lets you know that these are British prisoners of war. The second auditor. This begins in 1792, and he's known from 1792 as the accountant for the War Department. And basically he's taking care of everything for the army. And in 1817, he's identified as the second auditor. So he goes from accountant to auditor. The usual place, we looked at those for a little bit. Each one of these various auditors has 
employees, these happen to be the employees of the second auditor from 1817 to 1900. So if you have anybody who worked for the treasury, you may be able to find the appropriate register of employees among this material. And this is what it looks like. Basically, it's the name of the individual, when they were, what month and year they were appointed, and from what state they were appointed. For the Mexican War in Entry 387, there's a roster of officers and regular army units serving in the Mexican War. So this is basically a, a one volume that puts all of the active units involved in the Mexican War in one place from 45 to 50, including the, the unit's identity, the name of the commanding officer, how big it was, what the unit was doing, and uh, when it was paid and who the paymaster was. Entry 393 deals with the payment of bounty due recruits from 1795 to 1796. So these are the post-revolution, pre-1812 enlisted men who are gonna end up fighting with Wayne in Indiana before the War of 1812. And you can, this is what that looks like. There are registered payments to U.S. colored troops from 1863 to 1868. So if you have an interest in U.S. colored troops, this is a good place to start because everybody who gets paid gets named. It's possible for muster rolls to disappear, but because it's the treasury, if money disappears, it has to be accounted somehow, and you will find information in treasury records that you may not find anywhere else because those anywhere else records just don't exist anymore. But this is where you'll find the names of all the US colored troops between 63 and 68 who got money. Now on the frontier, there was, there was a logistical tale that supported the troops that was probably more civilian than it was military. And one of those groups of people that did that was the people who did the laundry. So the process was that you would pay the laundress to do your laundry when she gave you her, when you, when you got your laundry back. Well, some guys would go out in the field and die and the laundress had done their laundry. And when they came back, there wasn't anybody to pay for the work she'd done. So what would happen is she would file a claim with the commanding officer of the fort saying that she was due this much because she did the laundry of Private Smith, but Private Smith isn't with us anymore, please pay me. And the commanding officer could in fact say yes, and then she would be paid and there wouldn't be any issue. But if the commanding officer said no, she had the opportunity, and I'm assuming she, although it may not be a she, that individual would have the opportunity to then file a claim with the treasury department and they had the possibility of, of getting their money. Generally, rejection was based on a lack of evidence of indebtedness of the soldier at the time of his death. If she failed to say at the time of his death, this is due me as part of his personal effects, this is due me, um, she may or may not win. And this is one of the letters to the second auditor requesting payment for, uh, this is the cover letter for some laundry that was done. There are, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is covered by this auditor. And this is an 1862 to 1896 list of Indian agents, agencies, and schools. It's arranged by the administrative unit, and it looks pretty much like this. So here's the one from Potawatomi, Kansas. You may remember that Potawatomi is where John Brown came from. This is probably my favorite, well, maybe not my favorite, but one of my top 10, Army Paymaster accounts, settled accounts of Army Paymasters from 1815 to 1861, this series ends with the Civil War. 
or the very beginning of the Civil War. These are filed by paymaster and then arranged numerically uh, after that. So all the ones in front, beginning in 1815, deal with the War of 1812. I have touched all 1,736 boxes. These are very difficult to work with. What you, My error in touching all those boxes was not to write down the name of the paymaster for every box or the paymasters in a box. If I wish that when I, as I, over the years, as I touched these, I would have done that. It would have made my life a lot easier. All kinds of things are in here. Forge, pay, subsistence, bounty, lands. This is also where the widows and orphans half pay pensions for the War of 1812 and the payments for the Mexican War are found. These payments may be for last pay, they may be for widows and orphans. Sometimes a soldier doesn't get paid all the money that's due him when, his, when he musters out, so he files a claim for it, and this is where the claim ends up. I'll talk about these a little bit later when, we, when I tie it together with some other pieces. So this again, what are in here are the claim files, the application letters for claims, those kind of things. One of these applications, and we'll talk about it again, so I'm just going to go over it quickly, is the in, in the papers for widows and orphans in entry 516 is one from a Elizabeth Madeira Morgan, who's the wife of Zaquil Morgan. And in it, she says that she married Zaquil on the 28th of April, 1805, by the Reverend Manley, who later rumored in Ohio in the presence of Christi Christiana and Raleigh Scott. So what we have in this application paper is uh, the widow coming in, attempting to get her, fi her five-year half pay payments, getting them to commence. And there's an application number 3016 that's there. And this is where the application papers are. We'll hold on to this um, and talk about it a little later as we move through some other entries. When we get into the 700s, we'll talk about it again. Also in this application letter, something that you hardly ever see, especially for Virginia, these, this, these people were from Morgantown, Virginia, is the names of the children under 15 years of age and their dates of birth, including the one who's born after her father has died. I, if I have children, more children, I doubt I will, but I don't think I'll name either one of them Zadok or Nimrod. I'm just, I'm pretty sure that won't happen. Uh, and again, we have the residents of the widow in Morgantown. Nothing like being a Morgan from Morgantown. And she was married to a Morgan from Morgantown. Entry 517 contains muster rolls and payrolls that were found inside entry 516 and pulled out and kept separate just because they didn't want everybody fooling around with those payment accounts. And besides their trifolds, so they fix them to separate them all out. And what's really neat about these is if you're looking for Seminole War, whether it be Tennessee involvement, Georgia involvement, Florida involvement, in the Seminole War and the muster rolls and payrolls associated with them, this is where they happen to be hidden, except you don't see that word anywhere in the description. I have, can provide you with a couple of box numbers because I've touched them. Uh, so box 41 is Tennessee Volunteer Organizations, 1815 to 1818. You'll note that's not the War of 1812 because that's the Creek War and the Seminole Wars. But 42 to 47 also include uh, Tennessee. 48 is the Vermont Rolls and the Washington, D.C. Rolls. Somewhere in my collection, I have a list of what's in every box uh, relating to the uh, Creek War and the Seminole War, but I just don't know where it is anymore. So let's go on to the office of the third auditor. The third auditor took over the War of 18 accounts not settled by 1817, and there were a good number, and subsistence and quartermaster accounts, and anything not otherwise accounted for. Army vessels. Now, the Army probably has more ships than the Navy does. And in the Civil War, it had more hospitals, hospital ships than the Navy did. Uh, the original Navy. Hospital ship, the Red Rover, was originally an army hospital ship before the Navy took it over. And the third auditor, auditor also dealt with the expenses of the Civil War and the Indian Wars. 
and was the auditor for the De Interior Department from 1894. And a lot of that had to do with pensions. Again, we, in the federal records thing, if you, if you click on one of these blue things, um, you'll, get a, a, you'll get a full description of what's underneath there. I guess I should have said that earlier. The divisions are Army Pension, Bookkeepers, Military Claims, Indian, Land Files, and Miscellaneous Division. When we, we can look at pension payments, uh, 586 is the Register of Pension Payments from 1813 to 1866. So it's arranged by name of deceased soldier and they're under chronologically for the most part, although it changes. There are lots of gaps. And one of the reasons I say for the most part is because the first guy in the register is a guy by the name of Porter Hanks. Now, Porter Hanks was a first lieutenant of artillery stationed at Fort Mackinac. During the War of 1812, he woke up one morning and some army captain had commandeered a couple of British naval vessels and some Marines. And he took a cannon up to the top of a hill overlooking the fort at Fort Mackinac. And he pointed that weapon down into the fort. Porter Hanks woke up, saw the weapon up there and decided it was time to surrender. He surrendered, he was uh, paroled and he went to Detroit. And he, then uh, General Hull decides to court martial him because in all of the history of the United States, not that that history is very long, no one has ever surrendered without firing a shot in the United States Army. So he's done a first. So he's being court-martialed and they take a break and he's out on the porch having a smoke when Isaac Brock, the general of Canadian forces over in Windsor across the river from Detroit, decides to start bombarding Detroit. And a um, cannonball takes off the head of Porter Hanks, uh, according to some accounts. But regardless of what actually happens, Porter Hanks is no longer alive the court martial abates, and therefore his wife, Mary, I think is her name, gets a five year half pay pension, and this is the record of her payments. That's pretty long winded. There are also two kind of neat sections in this book. One are the, the payments to the heirs of the Cherokee warriors who uh, were killed at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and then the rest are just pensions to uh, widow and orphan pensions for 1821 to 1822. But this is the place where you're going to find the half pay pensions that you can't find anywhere else. And the names of all of the Native American Cherokee who were killed at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. My own third great grandfather was there at Horseshoe Bend. Then there's a register of half pay pensions paid by the Office of the Paymaster General. And this is for uh, there are 24 volumes. And these are sorted by state. And they look like this. And basically, we see the name. You will see that there's sometimes is a date in the left hand column. And that date will refer you back to the date of the uh, of the account in those entry 516 paymaster accounts. So that's helpful. It will give you the name of the soldier, whether it's a widow or children being paid, and then it will tell you when they were being paid. Now there's another entry, 588, which deals with half pay pensions paid by the third auditor. So it's not by the army paymaster, but by the third auditor. And these go from 1811 to 1833. Mainly they cover the period of 1821 to 33. And this is a single volume. And it's just a single volume. And it's all states combined together. There are registers of pension payments out on Ancestry. And they cover the period of March 1789 to 1872. And what these are registers associated with the payments in entry 721 and 722, which I'll talk about. But these are these are out on Ancestry. And in real life, they look like this. I only wish that they look like this on Ancestry. They don't. 
they're black and white on Ancestry. So you don't get to see the annotations. So we see the original entries uh, are in blue ink and then the follow on entries uh, when they die, the date of death, whether there was a, an accounting under the settled accounts of 6 April 1838, which I'll talk about in a bit or not. But this one happens to be North Carolina. I don't think they actually served these. I think this got served to me by mistake. But I think if you um, ask for 588, this is what you're going to end up with. But you're going to have to tell them what state it is. Dealing with the Revolutionary War, entry 636 deals with claim files relating to service in the Revolutionary War. So these aren't the pensions. These are where somebody bought something, paid something, did something for, for the Continental Congress, uh, largely, or uh, relating to a soldier or an heir who felt they were due something, told they would be paid for something and they weren't, those kind of things. This is sort of the equivalent of what we see in many states as state claims. Now, entry 721, these are the settled accounts of pension agents from 1813 to 1899. There are 4,712 boxes. They're by state, then by agency. And they include, at the end of the run, Army pensions from 1818 to 1864 and Navy pensions from 1818 to 1894. These are, these are payments now. These are not the application files. So remember, we, we have law that makes a pension and makes someone eligible for a pension. We have an application letter or set of letters that the government agrees to grant the pension. The government issues a certificate, a, a claim, and then the person submits that claim every six months, March and September, to a pension agent who's usually found in a bank. So that's, that's what these are. These are the end result of them talking to that pension agent. And they're all, they're all trifolds in boxes. This is what a typical box in 217 looks the label for. This is telling us, this is from entry 721, and it's telling you that this is box 3699, entry 721, and that these are settled accounts of pension agents from Nashville in 1834, second, first and second quarter. So the way that you order these is by act, agency, year, and quarter. You don't ask for them for them by individual name. Uh, they won't serve them to you. So you get a box and for an act, an agency, year, and quarter. And you go through that box until you find the person that you're looking for. Well, I can remember one day, probably 20 or 30 years ago, sitting down with a box. I was looking for a James Hamilton in the Vincennes agency for a client I was working for. And all of a sudden, I come across Samuel T. Scott in the Vincennes agency. And that's my third great grandfather, the guy that was at the Battle of New Orleans. Stopped doing what I was doing to pay attention to my ancestor rather than my client. Can you imagine that? But that's the joy of getting it by boxes. Now, these pension office ledgers are on T718, ledgers of payments 1818 to 1872. They're found on Ancestry, and they have added some of the stuff that's prior to uh, 1818 to it. Uh, there are two different series of records, two sets of microfilm, but what we're talking about here is T718. And I created a finding aid to the, I create finding aids for fun. So I created a finding aid to those ledgers, which are on Ancestry, because, just because, long before Ancestry put them up, I was playing in these records, and there was only one finding aid in one place. And half the time I found it was wrong. So I decided to do it again. And I did. So basically you can look at, remember North Carolina was at the top of that page. Well, this is what the Virginia page looks like, or at least part of it. So you have Virginia, but you may also have Richmond. They cover the years 1818, 1832. Those are the acts. And then the period, the dates of the page are there. 1818, March, September, 1819, March, September and on to 1832. 
uh, and then they'll start a new volume in 1833 kind of thing. The letters describe what microfilm it was on, what role of microfilm it was on, although because it's on ancestry, you don't worry about that so much, but you can convert the crosswalk from what's on ancestry in the browse function uh, with this chart. And you also get the page numbers that that law um, is actually found on for that agency. And we'll find these on ancestry. And we're gonna talk for a minute about a guy by the name of Hedgeman Triplett. If you look for Hedgeman, you won't see that he's in any of the US pensioners, 1818 to 1872. But if you just look for triplet, you'll see somebody seen man triplet. And that happens to be Hedgeman. Hedgeman lives in Franklin County, Kentucky. So that's our man. When you look at what's actually on Ancestry, you can see how difficult this can become and how patient you're going to have to become. And the reason that it says men triplet is there is, let's back up. You'll note here on the left hand side, there's this big glob of black. Well, that Hedgeman triplet's name, Hedgeman is under that big block of black right there. And that's why they didn't bother to guess at what his name was. This acts like a census because I can tell when people move between pension agencies within six months instead of a census where I can do it for only 10 years. But that's another talk all by itself. So those were entry 721. So 722 are selected final payment vouchers. So in the 1960s, 1960s, this, the archives was trying to create space. So they thought what we do is we'd separate the last payment in those tails of that ledger we just looked at and put them all in a separate set. And so they are out there as a separate set of the last or final payment vouchers uh, for this time period. There's an index to these vouchers on fold three. So let's look at Hedgeman Triple. So here's a, it's actually a slip of paper for Hedgeman. Notice here they have Hedgeman, Kentucky, Act of 1832, second quarter, 1837. And this is his last payment. And there's an asterisk up there on the quarter. Remember that asterisk. So these are on fold three, these pieces of paper. A last payment is the last time the pension office pays a pensioner. Now they can stop paying a pensioner because he moves, he dies, and no one picked up a final payment or the pensioner doesn't need the hassle anymore. Here's another one for Hedgeman Triplet. And this is not really common. Usually there's only one. There may be one for the soldier, one for the widow, but generally there's only one per person. But Hedgeman has two. And you'll notice that here, they sort of wrote in the HED part because uh, of that big blog of ink. And here it says, Kentucky 1832, that's consistent with the first one. Date of payment, first quarter 1839, but now it has a date of death, 22 September 1837. So that means someone was paid his arrears payment in 1839 after he died. This is what's called a final payment. A final payment is when the heirs or a individual representing the heirs is paid the money that is in arrears, that is due the pensioner since his last payment between his last payment and his date of death. So final payments are made to heirs. You always want to hope for a final payment, date of last payment to date of death. And it may occur decades after the pensioner's death. This is a piece of paper that's found in that uh, final payment. This is his revolutionary claim. Remember I told you that you would present the claim document to the pension agent? This is the document that would be presented. Now, the reason the government has it is because in order to get the final payment, you turn in as part of the process, the claim document. So the final payments, generally, not always, but generally include the Revolutionary War claim. So let's talk about entry 724. These are settled accounts for the payment of accrued pensions, final payments from 1838 to 1865. What happened was 
people weren't picking their pension payments up and the government got tired of the money laying around in pension agencies. So they said, if you haven't picked up your pension in three cycles, then they need to come to Washington to get it. Now, some people uh, would just wait till it went to Washington because they lived in Maryland and it was quicker to go to Washington than it was to go to Baltimore because they lived in Northern Virginia or Richmond for that matter. I mean, a lot of people played the system, but these, this is people coming in to get money because it languished in pension agencies for too long. I was so intrigued by this that I wrote a finding aid. Can you imagine that? I, I wrote another finding aid called the Lost Pension Settled Accounts for the Act of 6 April 1838. Now you may remember, uh, you may have seen these inside pension application files. This is from, um, a pension application file of Hedgeman Triplett. And here we see there's a letter that says that he's being paid, that, that the heirs are being paid under the act of 6 April, 1838. There actually are three of these pieces of paper in Hedgeman Triplett's file. They're, three, they're for three different purposes. They're not three copies. They're not an original and two copies. There are three, three of these in the file. This is what, uh, Hedgeman Triplets, 6 April, 1838, one of his three files look like, and it, it's a trifold. And inside it, it he talks about, the, 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 the kids talk about themselves. Widows and Orphans of the War of 1812, entry 726 is 51 boxes. And when I looked at these, I was concerned because there was no marriage information. So here's Elizabeth Morgan, widow of Captain Zekiel Morgan, deceased of the 12th Infantry, who died on 24 August 1814 of what I hope to die of fatigue at a very old age. Um, and there are two payments there out in Monongahela County. There's a document inside that says, Paymaster General's Office, Robert Brent. There's an account number. There's a date, and I wondered where are these records? And of course, I fall asleep at night reading my finding aids. So I remembered entry 516. I went and looked at 516. Yep, it said Army Paymasters. So I went and looked, and there it was. And that's how we got the record that I showed you previously that told us that she was married uh, in 1808 by the Reverend Manley, who had subsequently went to Ohio in the presence of. Christiana and Raleigh Scott. Now, some of the other things that we'll find in uh, Record Group 217 that are kind of cool are entry 728 or applications for payment of deceased checks issued to deceased pensioners. It's so disorganized it'll take me it would it would take me three years to go through all 26 boxes and get it figured out what exactly was there. But there's got to be some good stuff in there. If you're a masochist this is the one that you really want to play with. But it also includes, among this stuff are the applications for payment of check without administration. When the government sends a check to a pensioner, he's died. And the estate can't cash the check because the check is dated after he died. If the check is dated before he died, there's no problem. It just gets paid by the estate. But if it's afterwards, the government has to reissue a check and there are applications for that. And those are found here. The settled accounts for the claim files, the approved claim files are, are found here originally, but they've all been put on fold three. The other, the barred and disbarred claims that are also on fold three come from the US Court of Claims account uh, record group, not from record group 217. The difference being because the barred and disallowed, there was no money paid these are the Southern claims where money was actually paid. There are state claims for the revolution, for the War of 1812, for Indian Wars, for the Dakota Wars, for all, kind, all kinds of state claims are out there. And those are also out there in, in Record Group 217. They're in the 750s uh, based on the state. 751 is Pennsylvania Revolution, 752, is Pennsylvania War of 1812. There are muster rolls in these state claims that don't exist anywhere else. 
And basically the state is submitting them as proof so that they'll be paid for these people. But I've, some all of these I have never seen anywhere else. The fourth order auditor was from 1798 for the Navy. And he became the accountant and then became the auditor in 1817, along when the third order auditor was created. And these are all the Navy Department accounts. There are Navy pension accounts, just like there are Army pension accounts, just like there are Army paymaster accounts. There are Navy pension accounts. They just happen to be later on in the book. Now, one of my favorite ones is indexes to ships and stations. These are the payments uh, made to anybody aboard ship or anybody at a naval station. And years ago, I had an interest in the Red Rover, that Navy hospital, first Navy hospital ship. And I pulled all the Navy material and I asked the Navy archivist, um, was that all the material? And they said, yeah, because it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So I, you know, remember I tell you, I fall asleep reading finding aids. Well, I remembered seeing this and I went and looked and I found three years of muster rolls for the Red Rover, including every sick person, every member of ship's crew, every medical, member of the medical department, the first eight Navy nurses who happened to be black and enlisted and called nurses on the muster roll and in the Navy, and then the nuns uh, that were subcontractors. There also are service records for Navy enlisted men and warrant officers. One wonders why they're here, but they are in record in entry uh, 816. And uh, these are, uh, these are kind of cool. The Office of the Fifth Auditor, that basically is the State Department and the Post Office in Indian Affairs from 1817. In 1836, the Post Office gets transferred to the Sixth Auditor. In 1820, uh, they add lighthouses to the mix, the uh, Revenue Service, Cutter Service. And in 1864, they add the internal revenue accounts. The sixth auditor, you're not gonna see because it's not in record group 217. These are the records of the post office and they're now found, they've all been, they were all moved out of 217 and put in record group 28, the records of the post office because they only related to the post office. Now, there are some undescribed entries out there. Like I said earlier, a thousand of them. There are, for example, uh, there's one box that deals with accounts of claims growing out of the Florida War. That would be the Second Seminole War. Uh, there are account ledgers of forts and ordinances from 1809 to 1914. Those deal with the War of 1812. And there's an interesting collection in undescribed entry number 104, the Fred Manning collection. And this is a check for 50 million dollars yeah 50 million dollars that's paid to great britain as a payment during world war one and just in case you've never seen a big check there it is the way they funded the louisiana purchase was to put out a bond and this is one of the bond documents in other words you would if you gave so much money, you'd get one of these and they would check off how much money you gave and that kind of stuff. This just happens to be a, a sample copy of the bond. It's a little worse for wear. So that brings me to the end. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have.